Good afternoon. Thank you all very much for coming along to this, our fifth in the series on getting to grips with your photographic collections. And you can catch up with any of the other webinars that you've missed over on the SCA website. Uh, we're delighted to once again be joined by Susie Clark, uh, our photographic conservator extraordinaire, who will be providing today's uh, discussion and answering any questions that you might have. Uh, I'm also very pleased today to be joined by Linda Ramsey, Head of Conservation for the Usher Records of Scotland and uh, the Chair of the Scottish Council and Archives Preservation Committee. Uh, Linda's here today to actually discuss a new, a revised edition of a British Library document that is now available on the SCA website. So I'm just going to pass over to Linda briefly. Oh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this um, fifth lecture. Um, I wanted to just sort of introduce you to the fact that we've been working with British Library, um, Nicole Monjou and Liz Rose, to whom thanks certainly go, and also to Susie Clark to provide this, I think, the fifth or the fourth version of the very successful um, Preservation of Photographic Material booklet, which will be a good reference for, um, for you all. This will be available on the Scottish Council and Archives website and also on the British Library website. And importantly, the Scottish version includes uh, an introduction from Dr. Sarah Stevenson, who many of you will know, former um, Chief Curator at the Scottish National Portrait Gallery and expert in photographic materials. Um, and also with assistance from Dr. Alison Morrison Lowe, who was Curator for Science at National Museums of Scotland, um, both of whom collaborated on a very excellent reference book, Scottish Photography. Um, I don't really have anything else to say except thanks to Susie uh, again and to uh, handing back over to Robert so that you can all enjoy this next webinar. Thank you very much, Linda. And yep, yeah, so that guidance is now up on the SCA website and I will post a link to it in the chat box in a moment. Um, just to reiterate that this webinar will also be being recorded. Your microphones and videos should be off automatically, but if you could please keep them off uh, throughout, that'd be very welcomed. Uh, today is a sort of introduction to best practice for preservation and conservation of photography, and I will begin the presentation now. Conservation consists of individual conservation treatments and preservation or care of photographs at collection level and both are important in continuing to make photographs accessible for people. However, getting decisions right or wrong at the scale of collections can greatly amplify the life of photographs or lack of it. When I carry out a conservation assessment, the aim is to produce a positive and achievable conservation plan. And this includes assessing the condition and rate of deterioration of the different kinds of material. It takes into account the storage conditions and their use and display. It looks at the importance and significance of the different collections and what's achievable within the resources available. All these things are factored into a conservation plan. And I mention this because sometimes people approach me with what seems like a simple question, such as, how do I rehouse this? And when you look at the whole collection, the answer might be, well, there's not much wrong with this or rehousing won't make too much difference. What you should actually be doing something about is why. So I'm going to give some recommendations for general mixed photographic collections and hopefully in conjunction with the previous videos, you should begin to have some idea where your priorities might lie. Let's start with a quick refresher. All preservation measures have to be based on the materials found in photographic collections. And I will just mention a few key points. Of the image forming materials, silver and dyes are likely to be the most common in mixed photographic collections. 
whilst high temperatures and relative humidity are likely to increase the rate of deterioration for most materials, silver can also react with some fairly common chemicals and for that reason storage materials tend to have higher specifications than you might find for non-photographic paper-based collections. The emulsions all behave differently with different solvents. However, gelatin is the most responsive to high levels of relative humidity, eventually becoming sticky and blocking to adjacent material. It also has a greater propensity for mould growth at high humidity levels and it's the most likely emulsion to be attacked by insects. Albumin, however, will yellow in alkaline conditions. The supports are also a major factor when considering storage conditions. In the video on negatives, it was clear that there was a considerable variation in stability of different supports, and this gives rise to quite different environmental recommendations. So you can begin to see how the recommendations for storing and displaying photographs come into existence. Silver images and gelatin emulsions are found in virtually all late 19th century, 20th and 21st century collections and so it's particularly important that they're catered for. Now let's have a look at materials used for storage. Firstly, photographs often come with associated housing which can be an integral part of the photograph's history. However, the housing can vary greatly in quality and some sorts of housing are much more detrimental than others. These are typical wallets and photographs from the early to mid 20th century. The photographs, often silver gelatin developed out of prints in these wallets, are often in quite reasonable condition and problems mostly derive from the lack of individual protection and physical damage and dirt caused by taking them out of the wallets or the photographs being compacted in them. So in this instance, the level of use would be an important factor in determining the priority for rehousing, as well as the significance of the wallets themselves. In this example, the sleeve has the photographer's writing on it, it has printed photographic information, which puts it in context, and it has the photographer's technical comment as well. It's also numbered, which ties in with a handwritten catalogue. However, the sleeve is made from a fairly unrefined wood pulp and is likely to cause silver image deterioration. So there is more of a case for rehousing, but also a case for keeping the enclosures. On the left here, you can see the box containing the negative, which we've just seen. And there's an arbitrary rule that old wooden boxes have mostly done the damage that they're going to do. And therefore, chemically, there is not necessarily a reason to replace them. Uh, it's not very scientific, but we need to start somewhere based on what we can see. So by old, we're talking about 50 years plus. As I say, it's, it's somewhat arbitrary. However, in this instance, film is stored with glass and it's an important principle to keep different supports and different formats separately. In some cases, this is for reasons of potential physical damage and in others, it's for reasons of chemical damage. So here, as I say, the film is nitrate and the box does not allow much ventilation and the two uh, negative bases need to be separated and stored differently. On the right, this shows glass negatives stored in slots in a wooden box. Wooden boxes, though, can often warp and even a tiny movement means that the slots become very tight and the negatives are subject to abrasion at the edges each time they're removed, if they can even be removed, and risk breakage. So this is not a good way to keep them. Here you have an album of film negatives in glassine paper sleeves, and glassine is a paper that was often used by photographers. It can vary in quality, but in this instance it's not too bad. However, the date of the negatives needs to be determined and the type of negative identified as far as possible so that the likely rate of deterioration can be anticipated. The negatives may require colder storage and the album may be too bulky for cold storage. There's also the issue of the section cut out of each sleeve for handling and removing the negative. So that's going to cause damage. So the likely use of the negatives needs to be considered. 
Here we have a box of albums. Apart from the poor chemical composition of the box for silver images, this is a recipe for physical damage when trying to access the albums. And this is the sort of damage that you can see in the adjacent image that you might end up with. This is the sort of compromise damage that I see in collections that call me in. A squash damaged album on top of a non conservation box, almost inevitably containing different types and sizes of material. Cased photographs, often making up a small part of collections, are sometimes packed in alongside other materials in this sort of situation, leading to the kind of physical damage that you can see here. And here you can see another example of the physical risks to objects of mixing material. You've got prints in Melanex sleeves on top of lantern slides with some old housing material on top. These boxes are commonly found in large numbers with collections of glass negatives. They are the boxes which the new plates were originally supplied in, but chemically and physically they're bad news for the negatives. The boxes become brittle, the fibres form dust, the boxes split, causing this sort of damage that happens when someone takes the boxes off the shelf, and they also cause this sort of silver deterioration often starting at the edges as the gases and dust from the degrading board penetrate that way. And the boxes may in some cases be of interest in themselves, for example for the processing instructions or photographer's annotations, but they're not good for storage. Other examples of poor quality materials which should be removed are papers like this, where you can see the effect on the silver image, and also materials like this. This is PVC sleeves used for housing film negatives. PVC can break down forming hydrochloric acid and the plasticizers can also seep out, causing the gelatin to become tacky and the sleeves to stick to the photographs. This is a type of horror story which has so far been fairly poorly documented perhaps because they were often used for family photographs and not art or institutional photographs. They're often known as magnetic albums for some reason and were popular in the 1970s and 80s. Sometimes the adhesive becomes brittle and the print becomes loose. Often it becomes tacky and welds to the back of the print, making it difficult to remove. The pages are often prone to a pinkish mould growth and the adhesive often causes a pinkish, stripy discoloration. So this is definitely a candidate for rehousing the prints where possible. This is an example of inadequate protection for framed prints. They should either be hung on vertical metal racking or at least have sturdy vertical shelving partitions. Plastazote, an inert foam, can be used to provide additional cushioning. In the case of plastic glazing instead of glass, it's a good idea to keep wrapping materials away from the surface of the glazing. So what should we use for photographs that need rehousing? Storage materials which can be recommended basically fall into two groups, papers or boards and plastics. Paper or board which is directly next to the photograph should conform to the following criteria. High alpha cellulose content, approximately neutral pH, undetectable reducible sulphur content, and free of lignin, buffers, metal particles, acid peroxides, and harmful sizing agents. Often you will also see a recommendation that they pass the photographic activity test, known as the PAT test. The most widely used plastic material for enclosures in conservation is polyester, often referred to as melanex or mylar. However, some grades of polyethylene and polypropylene are also acceptable. Any plastic used should be free of plasticizer and the surface should not be glazed or coated, particularly when directly against the surface of a photograph. As to what kind of things should be stored in what kind of enclosure, Glass negatives are best stored vertically in four flat paper enclosures and then in boxes or drawers in cabinets. 
Photographic boxes are best made from board which fulfills the criteria I've just mentioned, although it can have a buffered outer layer as long as it fulfills the other criteria. Calcium carbonate buffering is fairly unlikely to dissolve and be an issue unless it is directly against the surface of some photographs. As for black and white film negatives, black and white film based material from the mid 1960s onwards in good condition can be stored in polyester sleeves in photographic storage boxes or in a hanging file system in metal cabinets. The box string binder style of storage like this is often preferred. Chromogenic colour film negatives and transparencies, certainly dating from before the mid-1980s, are recommended to be in cold storage, but more modern chromogenic material, although better in cold storage, can be kept in a similar system. These kinds of sleeves can be transferred to outer cold storage packaging later if required, provided sizes match and we'll talk more about environmental recommendations in a moment. Most people would prefer to store prints in see-through sleeves and they can be stored in polyester sleeves with photographic conservation paper or board as a support if necessary or in window mounts. They can then be placed in conservation boxes as required. Exceptions are prints with delicate surfaces such as flaking emulsion or lifting pigments which may lift off further in the presence of polyester. These should be placed in fitted paper enclosures or window mounts. Early photographic albums often have raised decoration or clasps or may be in poor condition. In this instance they will benefit from being put in a conservation drop front box like you see here made to measure in-house or by a supplier, or in a book shoe. So what about wider housing issues? Shelving and cabinets need to be suitably physically robust, as well as chemically inert for photographs. As you can see here, this sort of cheap shelving is not up to the job and could easily collapse damaging photographs and people. All cabinets or shelving should be made of metal with a baked enamel or powder coated finish. Anodized aluminium is also suitable as a finish, but steel is necessary to take substantial weights. Plastazote, an inert sheet foam, can be used to line shelves or drawers or partitions in order to soften hard surfaces. As with boxes, old wood may be relatively safe, new wood must be avoided, especially if it has been bleached or freshly painted. There are a number of environmental factors affecting the preservation of photographs, temperature, relative humidity, air purity and light. These next slides show some of the types of deterioration which might be more obvious when photographs have been or are in a poor environment. The photograph on the left shows characteristic fading in the highlights and redox spots caused by sources of oxidation and exacerbated by high temperatures and humidities. On the right you have similar examples showing fading again in the highlights. Here you have examples of glass deterioration caused by environmental factors with photographs. High humidity levels speeded up by high temperatures. Here you've got examples of film deterioration. On the left you've got cellulose nitrate and on the right cellulose acetate. And to achieve that level of deterioration in cellulose nitrate it has to have been in a very poor environment at some stage. However, for some 1950s cellulose acetate room temperature will be quite adequate to cause the deterioration you see on the right hand side. Fading of some chromogenic dyes can take place in the dark, but mostly it is high light levels that will cause this, particularly when combined with high temperatures and humidity in the presence of oxidising gases. In the 1990s, considerable research was carried out, particularly at the Smithsonian Institution by Mark McCormick Goodhart, into the optimum environment to keep photographs. This defined an area of physically safe environmental parameters within which any physical changes in photographs are elastic. 
that means reversible. So for example, curls will uncurl, but there should be no cracking of emulsions. And you can see that the area is defined here by the quadrant A, B, C, D. Of course, if you move an object with no airtight enclosure from plus 25 degrees centigrade to minus 25 degrees centigrade within the physically safe area, you will get localised changes at the surface of an object which will exceed the recommended maximum level of relative humidity and later we'll look at how you get around that with cold storage. Within this physically safe area, there are greatly varying degrees of chemical stability, as you can see. Damage which may take one year to reach a set point in the line marked 1 is estimated to take 500 years in the conditions represented by the line marked 500 at the bottom. Varying only the level of relative humidity and keeping the temperature the same within the physically safe area will only decrease or increase the chemical rate of stability by a factor of two or three. However, altering the temperature within this area while keeping the relative humidity the same will have a very significant effect, increasing or decreasing the chemical stability 10 or 100 fold at least. Those with collections already housed in a tightly controlled relative humidity range 35 to 40% will see that this range falls within the physically safe relative humidity parameters at any temperature within 25 degrees centigrade to minus 25 degrees centigrade. However, those designing photographic storage areas may wish to achieve an increase in chemical stability more easily and sustainably by taking advantage of the broader physically safe relative humidity range and having a lower temperature and seasonal variations may be practical to incorporate too. The beneficial effect of dropping the temperature by even a small amount can clearly be seen and this fact also underlines the considerable advantage to be gained by cold storage for more unstable material. And I should also mention that relative humidity levels above 65% will also lead to mould growth. Now I'll just say a few words about cold storage. Some material, namely black and white cellulose esters prior to the early 1960s, are likely to need sub-zero freezer conditions for long-term storage. Later cellulose esters and chromogenic film and print should be stored at around 2 degrees centigrade, whilst black and white polyester film, glass negatives, black and white and pigment prints can be stored together at a cool room temperature. The photographic material should be stored in a humidity controlled cold vault or in an auto defrost freezer in purpose made sealed packaging and it's imperative that it is inserted and sealed in the packaging whilst in and adapted to the physically safe environmental conditions I've just described. Provided that the photographs are brought up to room temperature whilst in seal packaging to avoid condensation, the acclimatisation period for some packaging kits, which are about as thick as you can see in these examples, need only be two to three hours. Obviously it's cost effective and more sustainable to purchase packaging which can be reused as you can see here. The process of acclimatising photographs to room temperature and replacing them in cold storage should not cause physical damage provided condensation is avoided. However, frequent periods of use at room temperature involving the removal of an object from cold storage will clearly lessen the advantage of the increased chemical stability provided by cold storage. For many institutions, an auto defrost freezer will be sufficient to house a distinct collection rather than a cold store and also more practical and sustainable. Now I just want to say a few words about light and display. In theory, photographs would cease to be light sensitive after the image is created, but that doesn't always happen. And there is a spectrum of light sensitivity across different photographic processes. 
At one end of the scale you have halide fixed photogenic drawings, each one handmade, which may show a just noticeable difference to the human eye after three to four hours at 50 lux, say 150 to 200 lux hours. At the other end of the spectrum, you have a well-processed silver gelatin developed out print on a fibre base, which should be relatively stable by comparison. An annual acceptable level for display of a well-processed example surrounded by a good environment of materials could be up to 84,000 lux hours, so you can see quite a difference. Within some processes themselves, there can also be variability as improvements or adaptations were made, or depending on the lab or photographer and the quality of the processing. The condition can also affect the light sensitivity, and there may be other secondary coloured materials present, such as, for example, tints in the paper base or retouching. UV levels should always be kept below 75 microwatts per lumen and blinds can be used to reduce light levels and also photographs should not be on permanent display but should be rotated. Now I'll just say a few words here about air pollution and air purity. A number of chemicals present in the atmosphere are capable of oxidising image silver and affecting other photographic materials. These include peroxides, ozone, sulphur-containing compounds and nitrogen oxides. Sources of these include some paints and varnishes, cleaning agents, photocopying machines, woolen carpets and new wood. And building work and redecoration can introduce significant quantities of contaminants and it's a good policy to keep photographs out of freshly decorated rooms for a month or preferably two. I'd like to end with some general points about handling. Use two hands when carrying photographs or support them in a tray and avoid touching the emulsion. Do not use adhesive tape, staples, pins, paper clips and rubber bands. Do not try to remove photographs which are stuck to adjacent material and do not try to flatten or unroll curled prints. These are jobs for the conservator. And always write captions on the back of prints or on enclosures in HB pencil. To know what's likely to happen with your collection in future, it's necessary to have some idea of what sorts of photographs are present. And that's in part why I've spent the previous webinars exploring photographs in more depth. I've also attempted to show you how to appreciate photographs and how to understand them more fully and I hope you agree that they're worth your appreciation and care. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Now we've had a few questions come through already. And if you would like to ask any questions, please do add them into the Q&A. Sorry, I just want to check if Susie is still with us. Susie, are you there? Yeah, I'm with me, but with you, but I can't start the video. Okay, well, that's that absolutely fine. That. <laughs> uh, I will ask questions away then, in which case. Um, first one is, I saw the mounted slides in plastic and glass. Were they just to be kept in polyester sleeves? Uh, yes, I'll just go back. I'm looking at that now. Um, yes, you'll need to undo my video if you want that to show. <laughs> oh, okay. I've got to... um, yes, the um, they well, most people would prefer to keep slides in. Right, start the video. <laughs> Thank you. Most people would prefer to keep uh, slides in plastic, just from the point of view of viewing, really. So there's nothing wrong per se to put with putting slides in um, in paper enclosures, but that's just a preference that people have. So and polyester is perfectly fine. So yes, whichever you prefer. But as I say, most people would opt for polyester, really. And might you be able to suggest sensible ways of making high quality copies of photos for future production and publication? Would a single scan be a bad idea? Um, oh, <laughs> that's a bit of an open-ended um, question, that one. Um, I know that a lot of work has been done on 
flash and um, flash is not always as detrimental as you might think because it's such a rapid exposure. Scanning is obviously slightly different because it's a bit more protracted. So I think you need to know about the light levels of the particular scanner and be able to compare it with various recommendations that there are about particular processes really give you a more definitive answer. So I'm sorry, I can't be sort of specific about that, but that's, okay. uh, it depends on the scanner really. And there's a couple of questions come through about Victorian aspects. How would you store laser prints, which are the only copies of Victorian photographs? Oh, that's an interesting one. <laughs> um, yes, laser prints. Um, that's a different thing because it's not really a photograph. So you're talking about more of sort of paper um, records and some images which are on laser prints can actually sort of stick to plastic. So I'd be a bit wary of things with toner. Um, I don't want to be too committal about that really because you're not talking about true photographs so I think I'll 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 bat that one away so uh, as I say I would be a bit wary about putting them in plastic enclosures though because they can tend to block so you're coming back probably to paper enclosures for those. Other than boxing uh, EG Victorian albums what can you do to preserve the photos still mounted and what's the best thing to do with the ones which are no longer mounted that are loose? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Yeah, certainly. Other than boxing, what can you do to preserve the photos still mounted? And what's the best thing to do with the ones which are loose within um, Victorian albums? Oh, right, that are loose. Mm. <laughs> um, if they're loose and sliding around, um, well, obviously the best thing to do is for a conservator to reattach them usually and put them back in place. But if that's not possible it depends on the type of album but normally I would take them out rather than having them swimming around and put them in a, a separate enclosure. If there's just one or two I might sit them on top of the album in an enclosure in a box um, that might be one way of dealing with it but it's a bit difficult to be specific without seeing the actual example really. What temperature and humidity would you suggest for home storage? Uh, well, obviously the same things apply, nothing magically different happens at home. Um, keep them in a really sort of a fairly well ventilated place if possible. You don't want to keep them in a damp corner, so they're probably better against an internal wall rather than external wall. Um, avoiding sort of obvious senses of, sen senses of heat or uh, sort of extreme cool really. So um, ventilation and um, as sort of avoiding attics and basements as well, I think would be fairly good rules to operate by. And some slides, uh, they have them in plastic slide boxes and carousels, presumably neither are suitable for long-term storage. Well, that's an interesting one because one should say yes. <laughs> But actually, when you look at examples, they're not always so bad when they're in the rigid um, plastic enclosures, which shouldn't be the case because everything should tell you that that's not good, as you say. Um, generally speaking, I would change them over to polyester. Um, but as I say, some of them in the scheme of things, which is the point I was trying to make at the beginning of the webinar, when you look at your priorities, um, often the things that are in those plastic boxes aren't in the worst condition. It will be other parts of your photographic collection that are. But having said that, yes, it's a good policy sort of to change them over to plaster, to polyester sleeves, yeah, rather. And they're also much easier to view, obviously, than they are in the slide carousels and more compact. With newer digitally printed photographers, specifically inject prints printed on acid-free paper, what are the recommendations for them? Um, I would refer you to the recommendations from the Image Permanence Institute for those, because then we're, we're not really talking about photographs again in the same way we're talking about printed images. So um, if you look at the Image Permanence Institute website, there's a number of publications on there about digital prints or the publication by Martin Jurgens, the digital print, I think it is. So um, that's the definitive book on, on digital print. 
which is published by the um, Getty. Thank you very much. And there's actually a comment about glass mounted professional slides, uh, which keep well. Someone has lots yes. of magazines and master sets <laughs> stored. Well, that's, uh, that's echoing what I said, which is they seem to go against everything that you would think would be okay. But when you look at examples, I mean, I have family examples of those. They're not actually in suffering very obvious damage due to those containers, but um, you know, one doesn't know about the sort of longer term, really. So, and that's, you, it, you can't generalize as well because they're all different. So some will be better than others. Whereas obviously if you're using polyester, as in Melanex, you've got more consistency. So. You mentioned about large format negatives. I have, uh, you mentioned about large format negatives. Should there also, should these also be stored vertically? Ah, right. Yes, the glass negatives. Um, yes, larger glass negatives, one would normally store um, flat rather than vertically. It's the sort of standard small ones that you would store vertically. If you're talking about over about eight by 10, you would be talking about um, storing them flat, usually with a board divider in a box and smaller quantities in a box. You can also put plasters out in the bottom of the box just to give a bit of cushioning as well in case anything unfortunate should happen when somebody picks up the box. Super. If no one has any other questions, um, I think that's we can let Susie off the hook there <laughs> and thank her again very much for today and all the webinars that she's done for us in the series. As I said, you can catch up with these on the SCA website and they will be remaining there for quite a while. So we have now got an exceptional reference collection there for people with any questions or queries. Uh, I'd also like to thank Linda. I've just uh, included the link to the guidance booklet in the chat. So if anybody wants to go and look at it straight away, please do just click on there. Our, that is our last webinar with Susie, but our series on focus and photography is continuing and later in November we will be having a presentation by Dr Alison Rosie of the National Register of Archives in Scotland on dating photography through costume. So it should be a very different but interesting session. And thank you all very much for coming along today and see you all soon. Bye bye.